Good morning and welcome to Rye Hill Baptist Church for Sunday morning, February 28th, 2021. This morning's message brought to us by Senior Pastor Michael Franklin is entitled, The Riot at Ephesus. Enjoy! If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, we are walking through the book of Acts uh, verse by verse. Today I want to talk to you about uh, the riot at Ephesus. The riot at Ephesus. And let me give you the outline. Number one, the cause of the riot. Anytime there's a riot, somebody has a cause. There is a cause of the riot. Number two, the characteristics of the riot. The characteristics of the riot. And number three, the calming of the riot. The calming of the riot. You know, the early New Testament church faced persecution from the very beginning. In Jerusalem, that persecution came from organized Jewish religion. In Antioch, persecution came from prejudice and envy. In Philippi, it was demonic forces battling the truth of God's holy word. And folks, I am telling you, the demonic forces are stirred up right now. I want you to know that. It is spiritual warfare every day of our lives. Satan knows his time is short. He knows that. And I'm telling you, he is doing everything to wreck our world and wreck our lives. In Athens, it was the gospel versus worldly philosophy. Wherever the Word of God is spoken boldly and faithfully, it will face persecution and opposition from Satan and his evil forces. This should come as no surprise seeing this pattern all through the history of the book of Acts. The city of Ephesus was no different, uh, many, no different than many of the larger populated areas in Asia. False religion, idols, pagan temples, Hate and evil practices could be seen in all these metropolitan areas. The only hope for these pagan towns and lost people is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Establishing a New Testament church in Ephesus was a high priority to the Apostle Paul. Let's look at this scene in Ephesus, which caused a riot. Acts 19, verse 21. 1921. And when these things were accomplished, and you remember, uh, folks came, uh, they, they took their idols, they had burned their idols, and all these things happened. And revival hit Ephesus during, the, uh, during this time. We uh, spoke of that last week. Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also uh, see Rome. I wanted to point out Paul purposed in the Spirit. Folks, it's so important for us to be in the Spirit. If we are in the Spirit, we will know direction. We will know the will of God. We need to be filled with the Spirit every day of our lives. And, and the Word of God and prayer and meditation on the Word will help you in the Spirit. And by the way, nobody could tell Paul what what the the will of God is for his life. Paul knew he had a purpose. And even in this, this is the first time Paul speaks of going to Rome. And that was was one of his things that he really, really wanted to do. And so uh, he gave a hint here of what really the rest of Acts is going to be about. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy, who we know was his young son, not biologically but spiritually in the faith, and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. So he knew he wasn't quite finished, but the feeling there in what I, everything I read was that he knew his time was coming to close in Ephesus. Now look at verse 23. And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. The way is talking about Christianity. They were probably basing that on Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so the commotion was persecution. And folks, I've said it and I will keep saying it. 
the longer we live, the longer we go in this day in time, the more persecution there's going to be on the church. They are going to challenge the Word of God, folks. They are going to challenge our beliefs. They are going to try to tell us what we can do and we cannot do. And I'm telling you, I'm warning you, persecution is coming. The devil's always up to something. Hold your finger there and go to 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5, before we launch out, I want you to see this. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober means be uh, serious. Okay, it's not talking about drinking. It's talking about be serious. Be vigilant. All right, be ready. Because your adversary, the devil, folks, he hates you. He hates who you stand for. He hates your walk with Christ. He hates everything about Jesus and the church. He's our adversary. Walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He uses two tactics with us. Number one is fear. He wants to put fear in your heart and in your life. And the second thing seen there is intimidation. He wants to intimidate you till you won't say a word. You will just be quiet. You will just uh, avoid people and avoid things. And folks, I'm telling you, he wants to destroy. Devour means destroy you. Look at verse 9. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Folks, I am not going down without a fight, folks. We, I will fight the evil forces till I take my last breath. I will preach the Word of God till I take my last breath. I will say what the Word of God says and defend the faith till my last breath. Resist Him steadfast in the faith, knowing that that same sufferings and experience by your brotherhood in the world. Listen, folks, you're not alone. It's happening everywhere. And it is even worse in pagan countries and third world countries where missionaries die for the cause of Christ. So he's saying, don't be surprised when these things come. Now look at verse 24. For a certain man named uh, Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana and brought no small profit to the craftsmen. So one of these silversmiths, realize that, you know, these folks called the way, they're preaching against idols. They're preaching against these things, these, these uh, gods that we have in our life. And you have to understand that temple, the temple was there. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. And these blacksmiths, they made things, uh, uh, our silversmiths, they made things and these idols, and they profited greatly from that. And folks, the issue here first is greed. It was greed. Because people were getting saved, they weren't buying these things. They were even speaking against these things. And so he got the folks, Demetrius got these folks uh, fired up. Now look at verse 25. And he called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. So he even shows his hand there. All right? He didn't care or you know, religiously, whether it was right or wrong, okay? His conscience didn't bother him because he was lost, folks. And it's saying there, they are cutting into our income, all right? They, they are hurting my pocketbook and your pocketbook. So he, he was getting these uh, silversmiths, and they get them all uh, against Paul and against Christianity. And he says, verse 26, Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia. This Paul has persuaded and turned many people, saying that they are not gods which were made with our hands. You know what he did? He was complimenting Christianity. He was saying these people are everywhere. It's not just in this town. They are everywhere. They are bold in what they are preaching and what they are teaching. And they are saying that the gods that we worship are not true gods. And what was Paul telling? He was just preaching the truth. He was just saying, because we know even at that, uh, you know, they, they said here in a minute, you will see, well, let's read verse 27. So not only is this trade ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and 
uh, and her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. So what is he accusing him of? Destroying the temple. Destroying the God. Speaking against that. But still even at that, his main issue is with money and greed. Folks, I am telling you, money will not buy you happiness. Money will not get you into heaven. Timothy wrote, 1 Timothy, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy, excuse me, 6. Go with me there if you would. 1 Timothy 6. I want you to see this. Paul writing to Timothy and and to the church there says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. What is he talking about? Being godly is more important than being rich. Contentment is knowing who you are and, and being able to live within your means. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we will carry nothing out. Let me tell you how much money you're going to take with you. Zero dollars. Nothing. You can be buried in a Cadillac. You can put your life savings in the casket. I got news for you. It's staying in the ground. It is not going with you. That's what it's saying. And having food and clothing, the, with these things we shall be content. Twice he talks about contentment. And folks, the American way and the American problem is that American dream of being rich. Folks, it's needs versus wants. What do I need? What do I need? Food, clothing, and shelter. What does mankind... You are not successful unless you're rich, unless you uh, drive a certain car, unless you live in a certain house, unless you have certain kinds of suits on. He's saying be content with what you are. And again, folks, I'm not saying it's wrong to have these things. I'm not. It's simply saying do not make those things the most important thing in your life. Verse 9, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root, is a root of all kinds of evil. Money itself is not evil. We need to work. We need to pay our bills. We need to support our families. But it doesn't say money, it says the love of money. And then it explains it. Uh, All kinds of evil which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and and pierced themselves through many sorrows. Oh folks, I've seen money ruin people. I've seen money uh, 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 split families. I've seen Husbands and wives get divorced because of money. Money can and, and should be used in a positive way. But I am telling you, the whole thing behind these riots was greed. They were, they were saying, we want Paul to be quiet. We want him to stop preaching about idols. We want him to stop preaching against these temples who are, who are our idols, who are our religion. And you know Paul, folks. I am telling you, Paul was not going to back down. Paul was not going to shut up. He was going to keep doing what God called him to do, do. So we see the cause of the riot, which was pure greed. The second thing I want you to see was the characteristics of the riot. The characteristics. And let me just name three quickly. Number one was anger. When you see riots, somebody's angry. Okay, somebody's mad. The second one is hate. All riots are based on hate. We're not talking about peaceful protest here. There's nothing wrong with peaceful protest. We have all that. We have that as American citizens. We have that right to peacefully protest. But things cross the line in the book of Acts. I will mention two situations. Even here lately in our American history, they crossed the line. Anger, hate, and the third thing is confusion. Confusion. He said, she said. All right? And folks, the truth sometimes is very hard to find in all 
of that. Now look at verse 28. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath. Anger is wrath. And cried out saying, Diana is, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater in one accord, having seen Gaius and Aristocrats, Macedonian, uh, Macedonians, Paul's traveling companions. So what happened? The whole city, filled with confusion, went into the theater. The theater uh, would seat 25,000 people. So we are talking about not some place that was small. If you looked on it, I saw pictures of, of this place that they are talking about. And folks, it was huge for that day and time. So 25,000 people get together, I am telling you there, there could possibly be problems, especially when one man or one group of people are stirring the pot. And that's what was going on here. Much confusion. Matter of fact, some of the people that went, they probably only went because they were dragging two of Paul's friends there. And they were wondering, what is going to happen here? And folks, you know what lynching is. You know what mobs do in the Western days. It was, happened all the time. And so they were going to probably put these two people on trial. Why? Because they couldn't find Paul. They couldn't find Paul. Verse 30, and when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Why? Because, folks, they would have killed Paul. They hated him. They hated his message. He'd been here for almost three years, and they were tired of him. He cost them money. He cost them friendships. All right? There was such a, 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 a gospel root there now. There was such a powerful church there now. And it was changing them and their culture, and they thought it was against everything that they stood for. Verse 31, then some of the officials of Asia which were local officials who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Folks, he had already won some people to the Lord. We're talking about local officials. So he had made headway. But when you think of local officials versus 25,000 people that were acting crazy, and there was a mob, and you can see in just a minute this shouting and hollering and acting foolish going on. Verse 32, and some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. Notice that word confused twice in here. Folks, Satan likes to confuse people. He is the author of confusion. And by the way, folks, be sure and get your stats straight when you start quoting people. Be sure and look at the background. Be sure and look at the source in which you are looking at. That is very, very important. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. That'd be like saying everything I read in the newspaper is true. Are you kidding me? You have to watch it. For the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. Why are we here? I don't know, but isn't this great? 25,000 people, it was like a sporting event. Verse 33, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude of the Jews, putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hands and wanted to make his defense of the people. Folks, I am telling you, the lost world, is they are going to persecute us. It is going to get worse and worse. And if they could, they would do it without trials, folks. They will. It is coming towards that. The Word of God speaks to this issue. 1 Peter 3. Go with me to 1 Peter 3. I want you to see this. 1 Peter 3.13 And who is he who harms you if you become followers of what is good? <clears throat> but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Oh, folks, the Bible tells us in Matthew 5, blessed are the peacemakers, the peacemakers, for they shall see God. And do not be afraid of their threats or be troubled. Folks, I'm telling you, I know I've said it many, many times. I've even almost been warned about, preacher, you need to watch what you say. 
Somebody might arrest you. Folks, I'm telling you, I am going to preach the word. They are not going to tell me what to do. I have the First Amendment right, just like everyone else. There's freedom of speech there, okay? And again, if they throw me in jail, I know you will get me out. You will, I know you will come to my aid. So I'm not worried about that. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. What does he say? Just depend on Jesus. Just keep talking to God. Just be in tune with God. Folks, I'm telling you, how did Jesus do it? You think of another guy that, that had a riot going on when Jesus was on trial. Crucify him. Crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. A known thief and murderer. Jesus went through it. He was on trial. He's sitting in a chair and they were asking him, do you claim to be the Son of God? And he would not answer. And somebody punches him in the face. Folks, I'm telling you, it's coming. It's coming. But here's what it says. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Meek. Jesus was meek. And he's not talking about fear shaking in your boots because of persecution. It would be shaking in my boots if I went against what God has said. See, I, I'm here. I respect God. That's what fear is. And folks, that's what's missing in our society today. There is no fear of the Lord anymore. If you, do it, if you want to do it, you just do it. And we need to, in meekness and fear, do these things. James chapter 3. Go with me to James 3. James 3. James speaks of this in James 3.13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Wise people are meek. You don't always have, folks, you don't all have to win, to win the argument. Sometimes we win the argument and lose our testimony or lose our friends. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Folks, the truth is going to come out. Eventually, it will come out. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly. It is sensual. It is demonic. Okay? Demonic. For where envy and self-seeking Seeking exists, confusion and everything are there. That was exactly what was going on in this theater. 25,000 people were confused and cr just being crazy. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then it's peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Folks, I am telling you, no matter what's going on, we need to keep civil about everything that we do. Our testimony is at stake. God's reputation is at stake. It's not, you know, being a doormat. That's not what it talks about. When they ask you why, you tell them why. I'll tell you why I'm not, because the Word of God says that. Because my belief is this is what God wants, and we need to do that. It's coming, and we need to be aware of that. And Peter spoke of that, and James spoke of that. Now let's look back in our text again. Look what it says. And when Paul was about to open his mouth and said to the Jews, verse 14, excuse me, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, oh, wait, 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 oh, I'm in the wrong chapter here. Sorry about that. One page short. <laughs> All right, here, here we go. Okay, and Alexander, verse 33, motioned with his hand and wanted to make a defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried aloud, cried out loud, for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Can you imagine Two hours. Folks, I'm telling you, we're here a little over an hour 
all right? And, and sometimes, you know, uh, people just kind of get stirry and itchy and kind of, you know, oh, man, is he ever going to finish? All right? Can you imagine this yelling and screaming going on for two hours? Folks, I'd like to remind you of something that happened. It really was. It was a wrong thing with George Floyd. If you saw the video, what happened was wrong, folks. It was wrong. But here's the deal. That did not justify the actions that were taken afterwards. Okay? You don't start throwing rocks at policemen. You don't start destroying businesses. You don't start doing these things. There are such things as peaceful protests, folks. But I'm telling you, what they did was wrong. And we need to watch our reactions to persecution. It's like I remember the days when people would bomb abortion clinics. Now how silly is that? You're trying to protect life, but yet you're going to kill somebody inside of that? It's not right, folks. We have the right to protest, but we need to protest God's way. The way God tells us to do it. And, and peaceful protests are the ones and the things that we need in our lives. Matter of fact, the foundation of the gospel is God's love for everyone. See, what truly happened here was you had the Romans doing their thing and all these Romans in this deal. And then you have the Jews. It goes back to, uh, you know, race, racism. Is exactly what started when they did. They just said, listen, he's one of them. He's a Jew. All right, get him off the stage. And folks, be careful what you do and the causes that you support. So we see the cause of the riot was greed. We see the characteristics of the riot was anger, hate, and confusion. But let's look at the calming of the riot in verse 35. And when the city clerk which today we would talk about the mayor, had quieted the crowd. He said, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the, that the city of Ephesus is the temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and the image which fell down from Zeus? So the local guy comes in and he starts trying to calm them down. And he even gives the people reasons, just saying... He's basically saying, it doesn't matter what these Christians say. All right, they're not going to worship our God. They are not a part of our city. All right, they have invaded from other places, and they are here. All right, and, and that's what he's saying. Uh, you know, our temple, folks, people would come from miles around. They would have a festival, that temple, and, and that celebration of this, this God and in the spring, and that's probably when all this broke out in the first place. So he was simply saying, folks, those things will come and go. They'll get over it. They'll quieten down. Just let it go. And then it says, therefore, verse 36, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. And again, talking about the image which fell, uh, fell down from Zeus, that was what they believed, all right? They believed that out of heaven, this image fell down, and, and they created a, a, a God to worship out of that image, which we, don't not, we do not believe in small gods, God, little g. We believe in the God of this Bible. So there's natural, naturally going to be conflict, all right? For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples or blasphemers of your goddess. What are they saying? Hey, they have a right to express that. Okay, they're not telling people they can't buy that. People are doing it. And we're still going to have the temple. We're still, we can still sell things. So the mayor, you know, level-headedness keeps saying the things you're accusing these guys of are not true. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are protocols. Let them bring charges against one another. So what is he saying? There's a way to do something, folks. There's a way to do something. You do it through abiding by 
the laws that were created. That were created. In the second instance, folks, on January 6th, we saw a riot in Washington, D.C. And I was, I mean, everywhere I went that day and everywhere I went the next two days, all I could hear was, we are ashamed. Can you believe this happened? People took them, took things in their own control. They did things against our government. And they did it, and here's what bothers me, a man that has an American flag on a pole and is beating a policeman is not a patriot. I'm sorry if you disagree, but I'm just telling you, you cannot justify what they did. Five people died. One was a policeman. The Bible is very clear about respecting authorities, and I'm fixing to show you that in Scripture in just a minute. So I'm simply saying that is not the way to get things done. Folks, I was embarrassed for the United States of America. We were the laughing stock of the world. What are they doing? What are they doing? And it was all because of anger, hate, and confusion. Satan was behind every bit of that, folks. Verse 39, but if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the law of assembly, in the law of assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. What were they afraid of? The Roman government. They were still under the umbrella of the Romans, and they said, listen, if you do what you're going to say, if you, if you kill him, if you lynch these people, I'm telling you, we're going to get in trouble with the Roman government, and they're going to take away our sanctions and many, many other things. There being no reason which we may give an account for this disorderly gathering. And when he said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Oh, listen, folks. There's a right and a wrong way to do everything in life. And our name is at stake. Our name is at stake. Christianity is at stake. Yes, we don't need... I mean, there are bills that just passed the house. I am telling you, I cannot believe what just happened this week. A teenager can decide what sex they are now. I mean, they haven't passed it in the Senate yet, and I pray to God they are a little smarter than the House. But folks, these things are coming, and we can stand against these things, but we cannot do it out of anger. We cannot do it out of hate. Satan uses these things against Christianity. We need to go through the courts and the system and do it the right way. Our time is almost done. Romans chapter 13. Romans 13. This is my biblical base on what I have just said. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Romans 13, 1. For there is no authority except from God. Folks, God chose. God knows who is in control. He is in control of everything. And He allows some things to happen. Folks, there are a lot of people that believe we're under the disciplining hand of God right now. Think of Pharaoh. He used Pharaoh to discipline God's children. And just because of the election, I'll just say, I, I, don't, I try not to get myself into politics. But for four years, they did not like the election results. And, and folks, I'm just saying the same thing is going to happen again. History is going to repeat itself again. If we don't pray, if we don't pray and do the right thing, do the right thing, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So you've got a problem with that, folks. You need to take it up with God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror of good works, but for evil. Do you, do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the saints. Why do you think when you're going down the road and 
you hadn't looked at your speedometer lately and you look in the back and you see a cop or you see one coming this way, you hit your brakes automatically. Am I speeding? I don't want to get a ticket. Well, folks, if you never speed, you don't have to worry about that. If you put your cruise control on the speed limit, you don't have to worry about that. Verse 4, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, and folks, we need to support our policemen. Okay, they're not the bad guys. They're keeping the bad guys out of your face and out of your house and out of your life. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he who does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but for conscience sake. For conscience sake. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. And in Genesis 6, just quickly, Genesis 6, I want to show you that history is repeating itself, folks. History is repeating itself. Genesis 6, 5, when the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth and he was grieved in his heart. Folks, I believe God is grieving as we speak right now. Grieving by what's going on. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast, creeping things. I am sorry that I made him. But you know the difference between now and back then? He literally destroyed the earth. But you know what's going to happen next? He is going to come for his children. Come. That's why the days of Elijah. He's coming. And then through the tribulation and the battle of Artem, getting all that, he's going to destroy the earth once and for all, and we will live forever and ever and ever in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God. <laughs> Folks, I am telling you, the foundation of the gospel message is Jesus' love. And we need to love. We need to love those who do not love us we need to hold high the banner of Christianity. We need to walk the walk and we need to talk the talk and we need to do the right thing every time. Father, thank you for this day. And God, thank you that you're coming for us. Lord, if you came today, I would be one happy pastor. Lord, I love my church. I love my wife. I love my family. But God... Heaven is a beautiful place. But until then, God, we still have to warn people. We still have to share the gospel with people. We still are the light of this world. People are watching us. They hear everything they say. They watch our actions. And God, I pray they'd be godly. God, I pray we would not participate in things that shame the name of Christ. God, I pray when people persecute us that we can just turn around and walk away. God, you did it. You showed that it can be done. So God, I pray during these dark times that we as Christians would just rise up. Rise up and be who you've called us to be. God, if there's one here that doesn't know you today, God, I pray that they would come. If there's one here that have never given their heart and their life to Christ, I pray that today would be that day. If there's Christians here that need to rededicate their life to Christ, I pray they would do that today. Maybe come for baptism or even join the church. God, I pray there would be freedom, freedom of the Spirit. And folks, obey you this day. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rahel Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.